friends and colleagues and thought, thought sharers for many years. Um, just a little bit about the evening. Um, as you know, this is an introduction to the book. Tomorrow, Azra is speaking at the 92nd Street Y uh, about her book. Uh, uh, the evening is Azra's. Um, I'm a big fan of this book. This is a brave book. And as I said before, it's not one book, but three books. It's a, it's a creed de corps uh, from someone who has practiced cancer medicine oncology for decades. Um, it is also a formula for the future. Um, and the combination of that makes it very important. Um, a, a, an assessment and a formula for the future. So I'll let Azra take over the evening, speak for as long as you want. Uh, the evening is Azra's. And um, maybe I would like to ask her to begin by reading one passage from the book, if you don't, want, if you don't mind. You don't want to? Or just speak for a few minutes about how the book came about and what your future thoughts are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sid. I don't know if this is a real story, but an apocryphal one. But apparently, uh, Joe Lieberman, who stood for vice president um, after he lost, went home and was greeted by his wife, who tried to console him. And she said, listen, don't worry. You'll always be vice president in this house. <laughs> <laughs> in this house, no one can compete with Sid and Sarah in anything, especially their generosity. As Sid says, you are a cross between my mother and my editor. So that's how I feel about both Sarah and Sid. And I'm so grateful to them for uh, opening their home tonight. I'm very grateful to all of you for taking out the time when you're supposed to stay away from big gatherings. And we are only allowed elbow bumps. And my boss, Dr. Don Landry, told me, please cover that naked elbow. <laughs> so, particularly grateful for all of you to be here. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. Like lightning to the children, eased with explanations kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Why did I write this book? Really to address my own confusions, which keep increasing as I progress in my career. And anyone in this room who is not confused has not been paying attention. Because everything looks good as long as you don't start adding the details. For every complex question, there seems to be, in my profession, an answer that is clear and simple and wrong. And it has been confusing. Just a couple of examples. As doctors, we are supposed to be emotionally detached from patients, because emotions cloud judgment. And if we get too close to the patient, we wouldn't be able to make the right decisions for them. How do you reconcile this kind of self-protection with the need of patients who want sympathy from their doctors, who want empathy, who want warmth and closeness? And particularly in my case, how do you respond when your own husband, upon learning of his diagnosis, turned to me and said, as you are going to be my oncologist? 
Besides, why would we go through years and years of training only to remain detached, dispassionate, distanced from our patients? And th this is the kind of conundrum that really is confusing. I don't know about you guys, but I became obsessed with watching The Crown recently. And something I really identified with, first of all, I always wanted to look like Queen Elizabeth. Now she looks like me. We both look like two old women who are badly dressed. But the, the thing about Crown was that here is a woman, Queen Elizabeth, who was raised from the time she's practically a teenager to be a queen, which to be royalty, which meant that she couldn't behave normally. She had to always maintain a certain distance from everybody, which she learned to do to perfection. Until there was some kind of an avalanche and lots of children got killed and she knew that if she showed up there, she wouldn't be able to control her emotions. So she didn't go and the entire country erupted with criticisms of her. So she had to also reconcile this idea of never showing emotions to anybody and suddenly having an entire country wanting her sympathy. How do you recommend treatments to patients and have to say you will either die from the cancer or from the treatment? What is an individual life worth? No man is an island, each a piece of the continent, part of the main. This is John Donne, who writes so beautifully to express our connectedness to each other. Somehow, we share as a society in the individual battles that are coming on. Any man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind and therefore never sent to know for whom the bell tolls. We are all in this together. The terms that we use to talk about cancer, battle, fight, war, armament, magic bullets, these very terms that are supposed to empower you, on the other hand, end up detracting from the deeply human experience of going through the pain and the anguish of dealing with this horrible illness. No one is immune from it. All of us have been either have had cancer or are one degree or two degrees separated from it now. And if we haven't had it, then we have a 40% chance of getting it tomorrow. So it's not something that happens to someone else. Lastly, something that has been really a challenge for me all along and for all oncologists and there are many of them in this room today, some of the top minds in the country including Sid Mukherjee and my colleagues are here. How do we define that fine line between hope and despair? Especially when you know that there is very little that can be done then what should one's attitude be? And this kind of turns all of reality on its head. Because hope is what is supposed to be to give subject to action. But when there is no hope, it's like what Freud said in Civilization and its discontents that it's the hopelessness can itself become a motivator for action. For Sid, I would like to recite a Faz Sheer, I'll, I'll translate it, but for, 
for Sid, Sheher, uh, Simrit, Farah, all of you, Kiran. Mariam, Kiran, who can understand Urdu. Bita deed umid ka mausam. Kha kurti hai aankho mein. The season for hope and sighting the beloved is gone. There is only sand in my eyes now. Bita deed umid ka mausam. Kha kurti hai aankho mein. कब भेजोगे दर्द का बादल कब बरखा बरसाओगे when will you send the rains of pain when will you send the season of anguish because once you take away hope what you have to do is the hopelessness becomes a form of strength now you need to recognize the lion in the bush you need to recognize the the tumor in the CAT scan and you need to plan accordingly. And what you have to do then is live your life day to day. And so my colleagues here who are oncologists fully understand this that our job really begins when we know that Cure is not a possibility here, which happens for 30 percent to 40 percent of the patients diagnosed with cancer today. If that is not a possibility, then our job is, becomes the more important job of helping our patients walk through that, walk that walk. It is the only beacon in the vast darkness from which we came and to which we shall return. How we negotiate this passage, how nobly we negotiate this passage is what is important. And I will end by quoting my favorite Emily Dickinson who tells us how to negotiate this passage. I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample I could finish enmity. How beautiful are these lines. I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample I could finish enmity. Nor had I time to love but since some industry must be the little toil of love I thought was good enough for me. Thank you. So, um, dinner will be served. I have a small thing to say, which is that uh, I took my daughters who are upstairs doing homework and they will come down. They're like uh, spirits. Um, <laughs> and I took them to Emily, uh, Sarah got an honorary degree from Amherst. And I took them to Emily Dickinson's house. And uh, the next week, um, my younger daughter, Aria, was asked to write a piece on what she had done the week before. And this is a. Uh, this is a testament to how important Emily is in our lives. Aria wrote, Emily Dickinson invented modern poetry. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the same sense, Azra has invented a genre of, uh, this is not to make a silly comparison, but Azra has invented a genre in which you can negotiate the um, hope that we will do better with cancer, with the reality of what's happening today. Um, and that's a genre, because you can either fall on the left side or the right side, and there are very few people in the middle. Azra has found that middle. Um, and she has invented a modern description of 
where we are and where we're going. So congratulations and thank you. And thank you. I like to have the last word always. <laughs> I can scarcely get a word in. <laughs> Surgeons must be very careful when they test the knife. Emily Dickinson again. <laughs> Surgeons must be very careful when they test the knife. Underneath their fine incisions rests the culprit, life. <laughs> I really thank all of you, especially Sid and Sarah, for hosting this. I wanted this to be a very happy evening, and I'm so excited to celebrate um, uh, Sid's new home <laughs> with us all. <also. laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sid.